Okay, for the second part, we're going to talk about we can't have statistics without some sort of design and the design, experimental design, as to how we're going to gather our statistics. Now, I talk about an archetypal experiment, and we're going to be over this through the first five chapters of our book, is the most powerful experimental design is a two-group design where we have an experimental group and we have a control group. And we typically, if we're trying to do a treatment, we give the experimental group something. We want to control for the idea that we've given this group something special. And of course, the control group then must get something equivalent to this treatment. And we call that the placebo group. Often, if it's, if it's a treatment. And we want to treat them the same way, just in case the way we've treated this group. It's not the treatment per se, but we made them feel so special, we want to make this group feel just as special. So, this two group design, this part in terms of variables is called our independent variable. And it's the independent variable, as you'll see in chapter one, is the independent variable is the thing we're manipulating. And we're manipulating a treatment to see if it works or not. The placebo is going to control for treating this group special. And then we're going to measure them to see if it worked by this by dependent variable, or sometimes called the response variable. And so we'll, this treatment will give them, will turn into some numbers, some group of numbers. Each group will have one subject or participant. This will be participant one's outcome. Participant two outcome, participant the last participant, which we could say the kth, kth participant or the last person in that set of numbers. Here's the next participant of the first participant in the control group, and the kth participant here, the last participant in that group. This dependent variable, we may measure them on some sort of continuous scale. We'll go over that in chapter one. And we'll take a mean, like I said, we will measure the average, which is summing up all the numbers, divided by the number of numbers, and seeing what their average score is, seeing what their average score is. If on this measuring scale, this dependent variable, it's how much better you feel, then we might expect that this mean, if the treatment works, this mean's going to be better or bigger than this mean. If it lowers our pain, and it's a pain scale, 10 is maximum pain, then we'd expect that this mean might be lower than this mean because of this treatment. And we'll be going over the ideas on this experimental design throughout the course, but, but important to realize too is that when we're looking at the experimental group and control group, and we've designed the experiment that way, we call that, that's our experimental power. So we say in the book, there's two sources of power here. One is how we design the experiment, and that falls to us, how we design our experiment. That's experimental power. How we analyze it is statistical power. What statistical test we decide to employ, whether we use a graph or a table, however we decide to compare these two, is the statistical power. Now that question I always like to tease the uh, class with is which is more powerful? Now you have in front of you a statistics book and it says statistics, a general introduction. And I say, so which is more powerful, the experimental power or statistical power? And a lot of you might be fooled because the title of the book is statistics to say statistical power is more important. But no, experimental, how you design the experiment is actually more important. Because you can have a design so bad that no statistics can save it. And let me give you an example that um, <coughs> one of the big newspapers in America, USA Today, runs all the time. They say, like, what's the best football team in America? Let's say uh, in the NFL, the pros. And they'll say, 
Call this number if you think it's the Patriots. And call this number if you think it's the Broncos. And call this number if you think it's Dallas. Cowboys, I guess it would be. And they'll have a number and they'll say, oh, look, look, the Patriots had 772,455 people call in and Broncos was 685,115 and Dallas was only 522,719. And so USA Today, the next day, will conclude that the Patriots are seen as America's favorite or best team. And it's ridiculous because one problem here is you could vote more than once. And who's to say this is a, you know, a fair sampling? So the design on this is so bad that you can't make that decision. The only thing, the only statistic you could do to, to make this thing survive would be this. The only fair decision you can make. Is today, in USA Today, 772,000 is bigger than 685,000. And 685,000 beat 522,000. But to have any implication to do anything with the teams is bad because the design's so bad. So no statistic can save that sort of experiment. Now, when we start, we'll be going over this, like I said, through uh, the first five chapters, and this is primarily in chapter five, but we're gonna be working on many levels here, is we're gonna be hypothesis testing. And we're gonna start, in science, we have to be kind of conservative. One of our starting positions when we start an experiment, which uh, the average person doesn't get to see, is something we call the null hypothesis. This is generally a conservative starting position. And I know some of you have played hopscotch. Uh, I still see it written on the sidewalk sometimes where they have little squares and it says one, two, and, and people start one, two, and then they hop and pick up stuff as they, I don't even know how the game works. Anyway, I, I do know this, that you start outside the number one block. Just like in hopscotch, our null hypothesis in statistics is we start at a position called the null hypothesis. That's our starting position. And the null hypothesis we're going to symbolize as a capital H uh, sub O. It, it gets its name from null meaning empty set in mathematics. So what it says is, if we think that vaccines cause autism, which they don't, um, the starting position, the null hypothesis, would be that vaccines do not cause autism. And our position then, we start here, if we find no evidence against this, no evidence to reject this, then what we'll do is we'll retain the null hypothesis. And some people say retaining sounds like you're endorsing it. You absolutely know it's true. We don't want that endorsement. So, so some people say you don't retain the null hypothesis. You fail to reject it. And they say that's even a more conservative way of representing this null hypothesis. You fail to reject it. So our options here, I don't, I don't mind retaining that much as long as we remember that we're not endorsing it by retaining it. So you either retain or reject the null hypothesis. If we find enough evidence that vaccines do cause autism, which they don't, then we reject the null hypothesis and we'll have an alternative. It'll be in favor of an alternative. And I put a colon here after HO and HA, the alternative hypothesis. And that is that uh, vaccines uh, do affect autism. Now, notice too, put a period at the end of the sentence, um, 
vaccines do affect autism, there's a possibility that it could go two ways. One is that vaccines actually prevent autism, and another is that vaccines actually cause autism. And we'll talk about this more, but that's what we call the non-directional alternative hypothesis. So here we're saying it has no effect on do not uh, cause or do not affect autism. It has no effect upon autism. Here we're saying they do have an effect and it's non-directional. It could either be it prevents or causes. If we find enough evidence, which no one ever has, we, we have ended up retaining the null hypothesis saying that vaccines do not seem to cause autism, nor do vaccines pre prevent autism. They seem to have no effect whatsoever. So when we're designing these experiments in the future, we'll always start with a null hypothesis. It's just that, sort of like in bullfighting, they, although it's bad and it should be banned completely, um, they could just come out and shoot the bull, but there would be no grace in it. It wouldn't even be fair. So they just slowly stab the bull to death with waving capes and stuff like this. Okay, so we want to be kind of cool here about um, we could just come out and say, I don't believe it's true, but we don't bludgeon people like that. We start out conservatively saying, here I think there is no effect of this variable upon this variable. Here we say it does have an effect and it could be positive or negative. But it does have an effect. And that's what we'll end up testing. If we do this experiment, and this is how we derive uh, whether we reject or retain, when we reject or retain a null hypothesis based on evidence, we don't know if we're right. So statistics will never tell us, you're right, we proved something. We don't even use the word prove something. What we do is we say, I've rejected the null hypothesis, and the probability I'm wrong is less than 5%. And we'll do it in the decimal form, 0.05. And that's all we can do in statistics. And what I'm going to teach you in this class is, how do they come up with this probability, and why does it have to be 0.05? It's actually consensual validation. But it also rests and one of the people that was very important to the early development of statistics in the 1920s, his name was Fisher, English fellow. And Fisher was actually the one who gave us this P level of 0.05. But he didn't do it that way. What he said was, if you've decided that something affects something else, and you do that experiment 20 times, if it really seems to cause this response, like you're claiming, then you should get the same response 19 out of 20 times in an experiment. Do the experiment 20 times. Get 19 of it. Only once out of 20 did you get another answer, then you can reject uh, the null hypothesis. And that's where 19 out of 20, of course, would be 95%, the 5% is. I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. I'm going to say there's a significant relationship, and that will mean statistically significant, not important. Significant relationship. And the probability I'm wrong is less than 5%. So thus, at the end of this course, and five years after, what I want you to remember, if you see Somebody says P less than 0.05, then you know a number of things. One of them is they rejected the null hypothesis in favor of some alternative. And the probability they're wrong about rejecting that is less than a 5% chance that it just happened by chance or not. Thank you for your attention. You've been a great group.